This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Over a half century later, still here, having fun. Welcome everybody, happy to have you along for the next 30 minutes. Official introductions, I am Ray. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. Sit tight because we've got a lot of good info to share with you today. Coming up, machines running, dust steering, and trucks being loaded with tons of peanuts. All signs that harvest season is upon us. Oh, but will it be a successful harvest? We'll head to South Georgia for that answer. Of course, ag exports always on the minds of farmers, maybe more so for cotton producers right now. We'll tell you the unique position they're in and why the National Cotton Council sent a letter to President Biden asking for help. Plus, from turf grasses used at major sporting events to the possibility of coneless pine trees. This retired UGA researcher has been at the forefront of it all. However, it's his love of giving that will forever leave a lasting impression. His latest endowment and who it benefits coming up. These stories and so much more start right now on the Farm Monitor. Yes, the annual peanut harvest is officially underway, but it certainly hasn't been an easy journey getting to this point. Our John Holcomb spent time with the producer in Seminole County and reports on the many challenges he faced and what all he had to do to overcome them. For a farmer, there's nothing quite like seeing the fruits of your labor come to fruition. Farmers here in Georgia will be getting to do a lot of that in the coming weeks as the 2021 harvest season is in full swing. One farmer who's doing that now is Greg Mims, a producer in Seminole County who just kicked off this year's peanut harvest after quite the growing season. The 2021 growing season has really been a, a wet season for us. Uh, you know, there, there's not, a, you know, even plant fields that are planted, dryland fields that were planted have pretty much grown the same as the irrigated. Uh, we've not seen uh, a long, you know, long periods of time where there, there wasn't rain to uh, keep the plants pretty and green this year. Uh, so yeah, we've had to deal with the, the moisture, extra moisture. Though extra moisture sounds like it wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing, it can really present some challenges for producers throughout the season especially when they're needing to get into their fields. Some of the challenges are just not being able to uh, even even get to plant, you know, in a timely uh, manner. Uh, but also the, the big one after that is getting our sprayer back in the field, not only on, on the peanuts, but on the cotton as well. Uh, so that, that's been the, the biggest challenge that we've seen. Despite all of the challenges though, so far, it doesn't seem to have affected their crop this year. The yields uh, seem to be above average. Uh, we, we've only finished one field and we haven't got the weights back on those yet. But uh, as far as what we sent out of the field, uh, I think we're going to be uh, in for a good year. At this point, they're just hopeful things go smoothly for the rest of the harvest season. We hope to be through with harvest by the middle of uh, October. Uh, usually, usually we'll run about a month long uh, according to weather. You know, it we get a lot of rain during harvest, it slows us down, but most of the time within, within uh, a month's time, we'll be through. When it came time to start plowing up peanuts, we got about uh, two inches of rain. So that slowed us down for a little while. And uh, after, you know, it, it started drying out, we started plowing up and, uh, and here we are today. We're uh, on the really third full day into, into picking. In the end, though, despite all the challenges they've had to deal with, Mim said that the prices this year for peanuts and other crops are looking a lot better than last year, which can make a hard year feel a lot more worth it. Comparing 2021 to 2020, uh, all of all the commodity prices are looking a lot better than they did in 2020. Um, I think most of the uh, most of the farmers you talk to would have to say that 2021 is going to be a lot better year than 2020. Uh, just just for the simple fact of better prices. Reporting in Donaldsonville for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. All right, John, thanks so much. Now to other ag news. In a recent letter to the Biden administration, the National Cotton Council joined more than 70 agriculture associations requesting that additional steps be taken to relieve the crisis facing American exports. 
Dr. Jody Campish of the National Cotton Council explains why cotton is in a unique position compared to other covered commodities here in the U.S. Cotton is non-fungible and more granular in quality and use than other USDA-covered commodities. Cotton is also more reliant on containers and on the L.A. Long Beach ports as compared to other commodities since a much larger percentage of the U.S. cotton crop is exported. For the 2020 crop year, about 85% of U.S. cotton production was exported as compared to 20% for corn, 54% for wheat, 55% for soybeans, and 40% for rice. In addition, consumers spending on clothing and textiles has not recouped the losses from the COVID shutdown. In most of the other spending categories, the rebound in consumer spending has more than recouped the losses during the height of the COVID pandemic. Merchandise or assistance is needed to offset a portion of economic losses incurred during the pandemic. Reshoring or nearshoring textile supply chains could also help to offset some of the logistic challenges. The shipping lines need oversight and accountability. We can't have empty containers returning to Asia when U.S goods are waiting to be shipped. So we look forward to staying engaged with President Biden's supply chain task force in order to address some of the shipping and logistical challenges. Whether it's using them for decoration or the latest recipe, pumpkins are in high demand as the fall season rolls around. Yeah, Devin Jones takes us out to Mitcham Farms in Newton County where visitors can pick out the perfect pumpkin no matter what their needs may be. While they might come in all different shapes and sizes, one thing these pumpkins have in common is the distinct representation of the fall. One of the reasons is because harvest begins with the changing of the seasons. Even though it might not be the most common crop you'll find here in the state, it's one Kevin Mitchum is fond of growing despite some of the challenges Mother Nature has thrown his way. They look pretty good. Uh, we've had better years, but... Uh, this year's been a little on the wet side, so uh, we've had a little disease, but uh, for the most part, they look uh, pretty good. I really enjoy it. Uh, I really enjoy growing pumpkins. It's, it's tough to grow pumpkins this far south, but I really enjoy it, and uh, we try to do what we can to have a good patch every year. And that's easier said than done out here at Mitchum Farms, as the hot, humid weather in Georgia provides less than ideal conditions to grow in. And that's just one of the obstacles to overcome for the growers, as they must also contend with the constant threat of both disease and pests that this type of climate provides. First of all, disease, angular leaf spot, and uh, anthracnose and different things can get on them. And then we also have a moth that will lay an egg and it turns into a worm. And that worm is like a stem bore and it gets in the stem and uh, once it gets in the stem there's nothing you can do but watch it die. So we have to we have to watch for that moth. Despite the difficulties, visitors will be happy to know there will be no shortage of pumpkins to choose from. They will also be treated to an abundance of activities to take part in from hay rides to gem mining, all while enjoying some tasty treats. We have a a full full market with ice cream, donuts. Um, we have a pumpkin patch where you can go out and pick your pumpkin. We have hay rides, a lot of kids' activities, gym mine, plenty for them to do. People come out here and they want the full experience. Uh, we've we've found that you know they're not out here to spend 30 minutes. They're out here to spend a half a day. So we we've got to create a full experience for them to be here. So that includes the the food options too. It's not just family fun for all ages this agritourism operation provides, but also a first-hand education about life on the farm. And that's more important than ever, especially considering its proximity to Metro Atlanta, where farmland is in short supply. Well, we try to make it educational because a lot of people don't know where their food comes from. So we, we enjoy seeing the, uh, the people come out here and learn, uh, the public learn exactly what goes on on the farm and really show them where, how their food's grown and where it comes from. Reporting from Newton County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. After the break, his happy place is anywhere that involves research. But truly what makes Wayne Hanna the happiest is giving back to what he calls an investment in the future. His many endowments and who they benefit when the Farm Monitor continues.
Super Bowl playing surfaces, the greens of professional golf majors, the turf at this year's Summer Olympics, even some of the plants you see at the big box stores. Famed UGA researcher Dr. Wayne Hanna has helped develop it all. To know Dr. Hanna enables you to be smarter as a person because his knowledge and craving for information is contagious, at least it was for me. But aside from his incredible mind and work ethic, there is this huge, generous heart. After learning of the latest endowment he and his wife Barbara had established to benefit Georgia school children, I just had to make my way to Tifton and see for myself the man, the myth, the legend of Wayne Hanna. And there's all kinds of variation in this tree. And this tree starts out early in the spring, light green. It has a real, it looks kind of like this color. And that, my friends, is just a small sample of what you get when you spend a day out in the field with Dr. Wayne Hanna. Actually, the doctor referenced a show of respect because Wayne prefers just plain old Wayne. Humble, brilliant, innovative, Wayne Hanna is all that and then some. For me, the first word that comes to mind is passionate. Passionate about coming to work every day, even though technically he is retired. But don't tell Wayne that. It's not working for me. It's, it's, uh, I've, I've been blessed to have a uh, career where I loved what I do uh, and uh, been able to make a contribution uh, to the American uh, taxpayers and to, to agriculture around the world. Uh, and uh, it's fun to be able to, God gave me this job without applying, applying for it or interviewing for it. Uh, and I felt like there was a reason for that. And so I like to just kind of get some ideas that I think would uh, benefit the taxpayer and I just kind of can't turn loose. I mean, just love to see things uh, developed and the consumer or the public out there, the taxpayer like it. Born in Texas and raised on a farm, Dr. Hanna would eventually find his way to Texas A&M University where the original plan was to pursue a degree in agricultural teaching. But once on campus, Dr. Hanna says it was a professor who redirected his focus towards the research side of ag. And in 1971, his career as a turf grass scientist was off and running. Tiff sport, Tiff tough, all kinds of turf grass. When you were developing this stuff, did you ever think someday that you know you would be providing the fields for the Super Bowls or the Olympics? Did you ever see that far in the future? No, no I've never even thought about it. Frankly, don't even think about it too much now. But uh, I've traveled around the this face of this earth a few times, and uh, if they know about Georgia, they know about them because of the Tiff grasses, and not even before me. Uh, they were Tiff Dwarf and Tiff, uh, uh, Tiff Way, and uh, they, they knew about Tifton Way before me. Of course, we, we made improvements. We made some major improvements, uh, putting surfaces, uh, uh, cold tolerance, uh, wear to shade tolerance. We made some pretty uh, large improvements, and that just people need it, and people want it, and people use it. Now that he's made his mark in turf grass, Dr. Hanna's next endeavor, an obsession if you will, is pine cones. More specifically, no pine cones at all. You see, since the mid-2000s, Dr. Han has been at the forefront of a project aimed at producing coneless pine trees. Now think about that for a minute. No cones, less pollen. No cones, less yard work. The latter of the two, his inspiration for the project. We hadn't proven about how popular the uh, coneless tree will be, but you know, my experience is that this a very small percentage, I, I would just guess less than 5% of people like to pick up pine cones in their yard. And so we got the idea way back in uh, 2003 that, uh, you know, maybe we should work on a coneless pine tree, you know? And uh, we have 82 trees right now, trying to learn how to tissue culture them. Never been done before, but a lot of things have never been done before. Uh, and, and that's the challenge of it, is figuring out a way to do it. In my opinion, the taxpayer really doesn't care whether I work for an agriculture research service or whether I work for the University of Georgia. All they want is results. And I try to give the taxpayer results that they can use. That's kind of the way I feel about it. But getting results for taxpayers isn't the only thing Dr. Hanna likes to give. He's also extremely generous with both his time and money. 
As if one wasn't enough? Over the years, Dr. Hanna and his wife Barbara have established a total of six endowments to various organizations throughout the country. Their latest endowment, a gift to UGA for the Georgia Mountain Research and Education Center in Blairsville. It's not something that we feel like we have to do. It's something that we want to do, enjoy doing. We enjoy giving. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's just a, a joy of giving and, and seeing an impact. And we, we love to uh, see students uh, have that experience that we had, you know, and uh, by, give, by setting up these endowments, and uh, two or three of them, uh, or actually four of them, of the six that we have uh, benefit uh, undergraduate students or high school students. Uh, and so it's, it's just been fun to give. I mean, it's just been a fun thing to do is, is to give. We, you know, there's only so much you need for life, you know. Uh, you can, if you want to, you can spend everything you make. But most of the stuff that we spend it on, we don't need it, you know. And, and so uh, we just try to invest in, in the future. The man thinks on a different level, that's for sure. Well, don't forget, if you missed any part of this story or others on today's show, you can still see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel, The Fire Monitor. Lots of subjects to choose from, tons of content. In fact, the archive goes all the way back to 2009. Hey, and while you're there, keep clicking and like The Fire Monitor Facebook page. Also, if you have a story idea or if you just want to leave us a comment or suggestion, send us a message either on Facebook or at the address on your screen. That is news at farm-monitor.com. Up next, everything you need to know about the beef checkoff, its purpose, who benefits from it, what it can and can't do. Some of the info may surprise you. Stay tuned. Let's answer some key questions about the beef checkoff. Number one, what can't the checkoff do? By law, checkoff funds cannot be used to influence government policy or action, including lobbying. The checkoff doesn't own cattle, packing plants, or retail outlets. Number two, do packers pay the checkoff? Any packer who owns cattle for more than 10 days prior to harvest must pay the dollar per head checkoff assessment. Number three, do importers pay the checkoff? Importers pay the equivalent of a dollar per head on imported cattle, beef, and beef products. It amounts to millions of dollars added annually to the beef checkoff programs. When it comes to the beef checkoff, producers and importers pay an equivalent amount, and both benefit from the checkoff's strategic coordinated promotion and research messaging about beef. Number four, do contractors make a profit from the checkoff? No, 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 no. That's a hard no. The Cattlemen's Beef Board and USDA approve all checkoff budgets and program expenditures before contractors are reimbursed on a cost recovery basis. That means contractors pay program costs up front and submit a bill for reimbursement to CBB. Only after CBB reviews the bill to ensure all expenditures are within the Beef Act order and AMS guidelines does the contractor get reimbursed. Number five, what can the checkoff do? The beef checkoff's role is to drive demand for beef, both here and abroad, through promotions, research, consumer and industry information, foreign marketing, and producer communications. It's a mouthful. But through a strategic combination of initiatives, the Beef Checkoff keeps beef top of mind among consumers and stimulates beef sales. Learn more at drivingdemandforbeef.com or contact your local state beef council. Some interesting tidbits there. Finally this week, with an overall impact of more than $36 billion to its economy, did you know Georgia is considered the number one forestry state in the entire country? And a big reason for that, the use of timber for more than just construction projects. Damon Jones takes a look at one operation in Emanuel County that uses all of the tree, everything from the bark to the pulp. The process of turning trees into usable lumber on a large scale takes plenty of manpower and machinery. 
And one of the biggest sawmills in the state is right here at Faircloth Forest Products, a family-run operation with humble beginnings. My son got out of school and went to work with me, and one day we decided we'd put a small mill up of our own and try it, and uh, it was very successful. And uh, we tried that for a few years, and uh, opportunity come by later on that encouraged us to grow, and uh, we started uh, just adding on a little bit here, a little bit there. Now Faircloth is the supplier of lumber for CHEP, the largest pallet manufacturer in the world. That means logging, sawing, and packaging is nonstop in order to keep up with the demand. Now we've got a 100 million board feet sawmill here that we produce lumber for. And uh, all our lumber is packaged in right here on site. We do not sell lumber out on the uh, lumber market. It's packaged for a use here to one customer. And uh, it all works out very well here. We stay very busy. We are steady expanding and uh, good supply of timber and resources here to do it with. Sustainability is a major priority as everything from the sawdust to the bark is used in making a variety of products. Chief among them are these wood pellets that are shipped all around the world. And with the updated machinery that runs 24-7, more than 200,000 tons are produced annually. It works really well with our sawmill here. We use all the residuals here, go directly to our pellet mill. Uh, the chips and the sawdust, we use them in the pellet industry. And the bark, we use it to dry, fire our dry kill, to dry our lumber with. Now everything that comes in here, we use it. Nothing goes out. Uh, it's all used right on our home base here. So this is truly a one-stop shop for lumber as all the products necessary to produce lumber and pellets can be found right here on site, which simplifies the process. So what we do, we got large bins that trucks uh, come under and we load them on and transport them over to the pellet mill and we unload them there. And from there, they're, they're installed in the process uh, of the pellet mill of drying it and grinding it and getting it to the right moisture content to uh, make the pellets out of it. With Georgia being the home to the most commercially farmed forest land in the country, it's an industry that has a major impact on the state's economy and employment. The amount of people that's involved is tremendous. Not only the people directly involved in the sawmill business, a pellet mill, but our loggers that we got in the woods, the truck drivers, and look at the equipment dealers. Those are tremendous amount of equipment that has to be made through other companies to supply us to keep us from making this kind of product. Reporting from Emanuel County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Well, before we head out that door, just a friendly reminder that for all the latest ag news regarding food, recipes, and what's happening on Georgia Farms, be sure you check out all of our social media platforms, including farm-monitor.com. You'll stay informed, plus you'll see what's up in the world of agriculture and with us here at the show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time right here on the Farm Monitor. As always, have a great week.